You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. So my wife and I were watching the excellent Israeli television series Stissel the other night, and there was a scene in which the daughter, that's Giddy Weiss, gave birth in a hospital. Now, the woman delivering the baby, she barely glanced down for even a fraction of a second to determine that the newborn was a boy. And of course, we all know exactly what she was looking for in determining the sex of the baby. So you're probably wondering why I'm not mentioning the name of this body part or even using a slang version. And that's because in the early part of the 20th century, when the story that I'm about to tell you occurred, the press was limited in what they could say. In fact, they never mentioned exactly what happened at all. One really had no choice but to use his or her imagination, you know, to fill in the gory details of exactly what Bertha Baranda did to her husband. So I thought it'd be fun to see if I could beat around the bush and avoid mentioning it and telling my version of the story. Now, with thoughts of Lorena Bobbitt are going through your head, you basically know what crime Bertha committed. Yet Bertha Baranda is mostly forgotten today, while Lorena Bobbitt is still well-remembered nearly 30 years after the fact. So today I present to you the story that I've titled A Severed Romance. I am Steve Silverman, and this is the Useless Information Podcast. Useless Information There's an old idiom that states that it takes two to tango, and today's story is no exception. As with all marriages, whether they succeed or fail, two people are always involved. The male protagonist in today's story is Frank Baranda. And he was born in California as Mario Narciso Baranda on October 29, 1863, to a family of Mexican descent. His name first appeared in the newspapers on September 16th of 1893, so he's probably about six weeks shy of his 30th birthday. And that's when his first wife, Belle, attempted to take her own life after their marriage had failed, and that left her with no means of supporting her children from a previous marriage. Bell told the San Jose Daily Mercury, quote, I went to Fisher's drugstore and told the clerk I wanted chloroform to mix with liniment. He gave it to me. When I came home, I told my daughter Lily I was going to kill myself as we were left in poverty. She then ran out and called for assistance. And that's exactly what she did. Twelve-year-old Lily ran out into the street and screamed, Help! 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 Mama's trying to kill herself! Luckily, passerby Michael Haggerty rushed into the house and he struggled to get the bottle of chloroform away from Mrs. Baranda. Most of the chloroform was spilled, although Belle did manage to swallow about a teaspoon of it, and she did bite one of Haggerty's fingers. While she did have a burning sensation in her throat, Belle was expected to make a full recovery. Afterward, Belle told the same reporter that Frank had been physically abusive towards her, stating, quote, my husband always treated me cruelly, and on one occasion when he came home, he gave me a beating. Two years later, on November 20th of 1895, Frank would petition the San Jose court for divorce, and while Belle played no further part in the story, her testimony helped set the stage for Frank's second marriage. And this is where Bertha, or Bessie Zettel, comes into the picture. She was Frank Baranda's second wife. Now, Bertha was born on March 14th of 1877 in Morton, Minnesota. And unfortunately, the details of how Bertha ended up in California and how she met Frank, well, that remains a mystery that's lost to history. What is known is that the couple tied the knot on Christmas Day of 1901. Bertha was 24 years old and Frank was 38 at the time. But after about 18 months of living together, Bertha observed that Frank's love for her had dwindled significantly. She suspected that he was seeing other women, and this led to frequent quarrels between the couple. Eventually, Bertha moved out, and she moved to San Francisco. And while she was there, she worked as a sales lady at the Emporium department store situated at 835 Market Street. And while he never went to visit her, Frank would often write to Bertha, and he urged her to return to San Jose and come live with him. So finally, after six months, Bertha relented and she moved back, but unfortunately the relationship would remain tumultuous. So let's fast forward to Sunday, February 10th of 1907. Frank was working as the captain of chemical engine number one in the San Jose Fire Department, 
when he, along with a fellow fire captain, that's D. Amador, I don't know what the D stands for, but D. Amador, the two of them were arrested and taken to the county jail. It was rumored that both had been involved in some sort of election fraud, possibly in the buying of votes. Frank was soon released, although it's unclear if any charges were ever filed against him or Amador. Now, from this point on, the narrative becomes a matter of he said, she said, and that's because I'm relying on the testimonies that were presented later during Bertha's trial. Now, during a two-week period in mid-May of that same year, now, again, this is 1907, Frank suddenly stopped coming home for his meals. He was required to spend most evenings sleeping at the firehouse, so really there's no mystery there. But they live right next door, and Bertha was unable to determine how Frank was feeding himself. He simply was not coming home. And here's where things really begin to turn sour. Frank departed from San Jose abruptly on May 26, but returned the following day, although he didn't return home to Bertha. According to Frank, he left to get a fireman's cap in Oakland, and he ended up staying overnight at his sister's house after meeting with a friend named Geraldo. Bertha, on the other hand, believed that Frank had left in anticipation of being rearrested for election fraud and that he was making plans to flee to Mexico and possibly leave the country. And he may have been doing so with another woman. At least that's what she suspected. Then, two days later, on Wednesday, May 29th, Frank finally returned to their home at 28 San Pedro Street, and he invited Bertha to join him at the theater. They had a meal together, and then they headed off to the Jose Theater, which was located at 62 South 2nd Street. Now, as a little side note, it's worth noting that the Jose Theater, which opened in 1904, it's the oldest theater in San Jose. It's still there to this day. And David Jacks, who was a wealthy landowner in Monterey, he sold a popular cheese known as Jack's Cheese, and he funded the construction of the theater. Now, why do I mention this? It's because that cheese is better known today as Monterey Jack. Okay, back to the story. Now, as the classic Charlie Rich song goes, no one knows what goes on behind closed doors, and that describes exactly what happened next very well. The couple returned home, they had a short conversation, and then it was time to go to bed. Now, Frank insisted the two didn't quarrel at all, and that everything seemed fine. Bertha's version of the story, on the other hand, was that she asked Frank if he still loved her as much as he once did. He replied that he did, but she was in tears. After that, Frank supposedly made a vile proposal to her. But exactly what that was, well, that was never revealed. It may have come out during the trial, but let's face it, no paper was going to publish it back then. But what happened next goes without question. Bertha grabbed a straight razor, and with one slice, she permanently maimed her husband. Yes, Bertha Baranda had become the Lorena Bobbitt of her day. Needless to say, Frank was bleeding profusely and screaming in pain. So Bertha told him to stop yelling and that she would go get a doctor. Instead, shortly after midnight, she went to the room of Frank's nephew, that's Balbino Baranda, who lived nearby. And I did check and they did not live in the same building. She awoke him and stated, Frank is hurt! And without offering any further information, Bertha just disappeared into the night. Balbino quickly dressed himself and he went over to his uncle's place only to find no one there. What he didn't know was that Frank had run to the station house, which, as I mentioned, was right next door. Fireman Dan Durkin heard Frank calling at the side door and he let him inside. Frank told Durkin he was bleeding to death and he asked him to call a doctor. And that's exactly what Durkin did but he also contacted the police. When officers John Humberg and Theodore Swanson arrived, they first went to the Baranda home, but they also found that no one was there. Subsequently, they made their way to the fire station where they encountered Frank clad in his blood-stained nightclothes. Shortly after this, a Dr. Harris arrived and attempted to treat Frank's wounds. However, it was really bad and there was little he could do, so the decision was made to transport Frank to the Good Samaritan or Red Cross Hospital. It went by both names back then. There, Dr. Harris, along with a Dr. Holbrook, they stitched Frank up. 
they were uncertain if he would survive. Meanwhile, officers Humberg and Swanson began their search for Mrs. Baranda. They would finally catch up with her at 3 a.m. at a railroad switch tower, which was about a 10-minute walk from the Baranda home. According to tower operator Elmer Mitchell, Bertha walked in shortly after midnight dressed in men's clothing and she just collapsed from sheer exhaustion onto the floor. It was a busy time of night for Elmer, so he was more focused on avoiding train collisions, but he did try to talk to her when he could. He first questioned her attire, so Bertha explained she had been on previous hunting trips with her husband and she was very comfortable wearing these clothes. But after her arrest, she stated that she had changed her clothing in an attempt to escape to Mexico. Then later at her trial, she explained that the clothes belonged to her brother and that she had worn them several times before as a disguise while she was trying to find her husband. Now, Bertha put up absolutely no resistance at the time of her arrest. The officers took her to the police station and Chief of Police T.W. Carroll, he spoke to her the next morning. Bertha told him, quote, I had heard for some time that my husband was going to leave me. When he went to Oakland a few days ago, I thought he would pack up his things and leave, so I just fixed him. Bertha expressed no regrets then or ever for what she had done. Meanwhile, that morning's newspapers reported it was unlikely that Frank would survive. And if he didn't, of course, Bertha was certain to face murder charges. Bell was set at $10,000, which is over $322,000 today. And of course, Bertha couldn't pay that, so she remained in jail until her trial. Luckily, Frank did survive. Assuming no further complications, Dr. Holbrook estimated he'd be in the hospital for about 15 days. But Frank was now faced with a big decision to make. Should he press charges against his wife or not? Initially, it was thought by close friends that he wouldn't do so, but at noon on June 1st in 1907, he was propped up in his hospital bed and he swore a complaint before Justice Brown and it charged Bertha Baranda with mayhem. Now, if you don't live in the United States, you may not know this, but here in the U.S., there's a very famous series of commercials uh, put out by Allstate and in it, a character played by Dean Winters, he plays mayhem. And it's a very well-known uh, series of commercials here. Now, if you don't know uh, what the law of mayhem is, and I have to admit I didn't either, the June 1st, 1907 San Jose Daily Mercury printed the text of the criminal code. It reads, quote, Every person who unlawfully and maliciously deprives a human being of a member of his body or renders it useless or cuts or disables the tongue or puts out an eye or slits the tongue, nose, ear, or lip is guilty of mayhem. The article added that Section 204 of the Code states that, quote, mayhem is punishable by imprisonment in the state prison not exceeding 14 years. You know what I was thinking when I first read this. Bertha could be locked away for a really long time. Well, the case of the people of the state of California versus Bertha Baranda, it began on Monday, January 13th, 1908, with Judge James R. Welch presiding. Attorney B.A. Harrington defended Bertha, while Deputies District Attorney H.A. Bridges and C.C. Coolidge, they represented the state. And as you'd expect, Frank was called as the first witness, and Attorney Coolidge asked him to go step-by-step, quote, through the disgusting but essential details of the horrible affair. Attorney Harrington then did the usual cross-examination, and that was followed by a number of witnesses. And that included the firemen, the policemen, the doctors, and even Elmer Mitchell, you know, the switch operator. But the last person to go on the stand was Bertha herself. She told of how she suspected that her husband was going to leave her, how she found suspicious letters from other women, and what happened in the hours leading up to the moment that she inflicted that terrible wound on her husband. Yet, strangely, she claimed to remember absolutely nothing from the time of the attack until she woke up in jail the next morning. The entire trial would last about four days, and after closing remarks, Judge Welch gave instructions to the jury of 12 men. Now, I'm not going to read the entire thing, but it read in part, quote, 
What is known as transitory mania, moral insanity, irresistible impulse, and uncontrollable impulse cannot be advanced as an excuse for the commission of crime, where the person so committing crime is capable of knowing right from wrong. If, in the case before you, it should appear that the defendant was laboring under some irresistible impulse or some uncontrollable impulse or moral insanity, this would be no excuse for the commission of the act charged if it appears that she was capable of discerning right from wrong. He further went on to state, quote, Jealousy of wife is no excuse for the commission of the crime of mayhem. The law knows no sex in crime. A woman is as amenable to the law as a man. On Thursday, January 16th in 1908, the jury went into deliberation just before the noon lunch recess. Two hours later, jury foreman R.A. Crosby stood up and read the verdict. And I think this is a good place for a commercial break. Don't you agree? No, I'm not going to do that to you. Here's what he said, quote, We, the jury, find the defendant, Bertha Baranda, guilty as charged in the information. Then, on Monday, February 24th, Bertha received a sentence of five years in San Quentin prison from Judge Welch. Now, in reporting the story in the California newspaper, it described her act as, quote, unspeakably mutilating her husband. In other words, you fill in the blanks. Five days later, Bertha would make history as the first woman ever admitted to San Quentin on the 29th of February, the first woman ever to do so on a leap day. There was an attempt to appeal the verdict, and it mainly centered around two prisoners, and they claimed that they had overheard one of the jurors, who was identified as W. Kennedy. Supposedly, Kennedy told Deputy Sheriff W.H. Cropley that, quote, Bertha Baranda is guilty of mayhem. Her attorney cannot win because I believe her guilty. Of course, Kennedy and Cropley denied that that conversation ever took place, And ultimately, the two prisoners, they were charged with perjury, although I don't know the outcome of that case. And ultimately, Bertha's appeal was denied. But Bertha wouldn't have to serve out her entire sentence. She was paroled on good behavior from San Quentin on December 20th of 1909. If you do the math, that's from the day of her arrest through the day of her release, her entire incarceration totaled two years, six months, and 20 days. Little's known of what happened to both Frank and Bertha afterwards, but it should come as no surprise if they opted not to get back together, would you? Now, I do know that Frank's tenure with the fire department wasn't destined to last much longer. That's because with the election of San Jose Mayor Charles W. Davison in 1908, his administration embarked on a policy of purging the department. Then, in July of that same year, numerous members of both the police and fire departments were either terminated, demoted, or coerced into resigning. As a result, Frank was demoted from captain to what they called extra men, so uh, he ultimately decided to submit his resignation. It wouldn't be until April 14th of 1923 that Frank finally filed for divorce from Bertha. His claim, and I know you're going to be shocked by this one, his wife slashed him with a razor and deserted him. But what I found in my research is that California marriage records clearly show that Bertha had already remarried. She had tied the knot with Alexander Patterson on May 24th of 1921. So this raises the question of whether or not Bertha had committed bigamy. That, of course, is difficult to determine with absolute certainty. You know, there is the possibility that she obtained a swift divorce in Reno or another location and never told Frank, or she may have been under the impression that her marriage to Frank had already been dissolved. I guess we'll never know. It's hard not to speculate whether Patterson was aware of the grave injury that Bertha had inflicted on her first husband. And I have to tell you, the answer to that question is almost certainly yes. He just had to know, and there's really a straightforward explanation for this. You see, Alex had been previously married to Mary, who was Bertha's older sister. He just had to know. Well, one has to wonder if Bertha may have been a bigamist. There's really no question that Frank's third marriage to Josephine Carmella Warburton on June 9, 1925, was above board. This time, the marriage was successful, and the two would stay together until Frank's death in Monterey, California, 
on April 2nd of 1940. He was 76 years of age. Now, Josephine, who was 32 years younger than Frank, she passed away on May 29th of 1988. She was 92 years old, and she had lived 48 years without Frank. As for Bertha, historical documents show that she was a chambermaid in San Francisco in 1910, a laundress for the Southern Pacific Hospital in that same city in 1917. She was a waitress at Camp Meeker in Sonoma, California in 1920. And then in 1930, according to the census, it shows that she was employed as a hotel chambermaid in San Francisco. But her marriage status is questionable. That's because Bertha's listed as being married, but she clearly wasn't living with Alex at the time. He was residing in Los Angeles with his son, George, and he's listed as a widower. So did they separate? Did they divorce? I honestly don't know, but I can say with certainty that Alex passed on four years later. So I just can't help but wonder if maybe he was staying with his son because he's in poor health. Hmm. On January 18th of 1950, Bertha passed away in San Francisco at the age of 72. She was laid to rest at the Calvary Catholic Cemetery in San Jose alongside her youngest brother, Albert Zettel. Interestingly, if you take a look at the uh, photos online, their shared tombstone contains a typo, and that's because her last name says Barando with an O at the end instead of Baranda with an A at the end. Useless, useful, I'll leave that for you to decide. So do you happen to notice that the last full story I recorded, that was Marty the Marijuana Mouse, that it took place in the San Jose Police Department, and this story involved the San Jose Fire Department? I have to tell you, I certainly didn't. You see, when I finished the last retrocast, I knew I was behind in getting the next full-length story together. I usually work on it all month. So I just went over to my stack of stories, of which I had nearly completed the research on, and I grabbed this one. Why did I choose this one? Well, there's a really simple reason for that. It was on top of the pile. <laughs> anyway, I was well into putting the story together when a light bulb just suddenly went off on my head, and it told me that both of these took place in San Jose, and that's why it's that way. There was no rationale on my part for doing so. I should mention that I do have pictures of Bertha. I mean, there's obviously the one that's in the thumbnail image that accompanies this episode. I mean, if you checked out that crazy hat she wore for her mugshot, I mean, that really is over the top, isn't it? But I do have others, and that includes her prison information, marriage licenses, and some other miscellaneous things. So I'll post those on my website, which is uselessinformation.org. Just a reminder that the new network I'm on, the one that hosts this podcast, that's Airwave Media, they have a short survey they'd like all of my listeners to complete. And it can be found at www.surveymonkey.com slash r slash airwave. That's www.surveymonkey.com slash r slash airwave. But if you want to make it easy, just go to my website because if you go there, the second story down on the main page is a link to the survey. It's probably easier to do it that way. Uh, Now, if you do this, it allows them to determine who my listeners are, and of course, that will attract better advertisers. It really takes little time to complete. It's totally anonymous, and you can opt to enter a drawing to win a $500 Amazon gift card at the end. Now, my understanding is that the survey will be live for another month, although I don't have a definite end date for that. If for some reason you'd like to contact me, whatever it may be, my email address is steve at uselessinformation.org. Uh, That's steve at uselessinformation.org. You can also use the contact form on the Useless Information website, or you can go through Facebook Messenger. The Useless Information Podcast is now part of the Airwave Media Network, and you can discover more great podcasts just like this one at airwavemedia.com. Anyway, thanks as always for listening, and take care, everyone. Bye.